going to do it for the day. All right. Carolyn Woodin and Carrie Clawson. I believe I said those names correctly. Um, and a great coach. <laughs> uh, Carolyn Woodin uh, is a semi-retired teacher of literature and composition. Um, her biography is on the back of our programs here, but I want to read this a little bit. She um, has had a corresponding passion for writing for general readers for writing creative nonfiction. Some of her newspaper columns and commentaries for Wisconsin Public Radio are collect collected in Wisconsin. A year, her experiences of 1991-92 and letters and reflections from Poland, and she is currently sent to her agent a manuscript, Lands of the Suspended Sun, on her times in Norway and Sweden. And I think this is really fabulous that um, Carrie Clausen ha also has Clausen, has also <laughs> been out of Wisconsin quite a bit. She moved to um, Lagos, Nigeria. And her play, Letters from Lagos, is an autobiographical account of her time in Nigeria. And it was performed in 2009 and 2010. She produced an original play by novelist David Rhodes about the life of Gaylord Nelson, which toured Wisconsin. And for the past few years, she's written a weekly column, Letters from Home. Please welcome Carrie Gerland. I've written a 
a lot of biography, history, all of those things. And I concluded that all of that writing is very creative. Um, so I don't make a big distinction. I think Carrie does make more of a distinction and, and kind of defines the definition. So we'll get into that. Would you define what you're calling creative nonfiction? I'm calling everything that's not fiction, basically. <laughs> or poetry. Or poetry. Although poetry, you know, is such a shaky category. You can have prose poetry that you could call creative nonfiction. And, um, basically, I think that these categories are for the convenience of academics and award givers and various people who have to divide up different kinds of writing. To me, it's really a continuum. And so I don't do a lot of that division in my head, let's say, as I write. The thing that, I would say two things have driven me during my publishing writing career. One is that I grew up, as you know from your program, outside of Frederick, in the woods, went to a one-room school for eight years, graduated from Little Frederick High School with 57 graduates in 1957, and then went out into the big world. Now I'm back in the place where my parents had their farm. And my feeling has been all along that I'm in a, a very privileged position to serve as a kind of bridge between these many academic worlds that I've been privileged to be part of and the kind of world I grew up in. And so a lot of my writing and say that my radio commentaries at um, Wisconsin Public Radio are kind of trying to bridge. So I was hired at Wisconsin to do commentaries on the morning news show back in about 1980 or so. And they had to fit in before the weather, and so they were, they needed to be two and a half minutes long, and that meant 500 words. And it was to, to kind of relate women's history, American history, women writers, to things that were happening in the news. Well, you can imagine what a great discipline this was for a writer and privilege. Because I had to come up with something every week. I had to limit myself to 500 words. And I had to constantly be alert to how things connect. Something comes up on the news. How does that connect with something I read from Anne Bradstreet in the 17th century, say? Um, so it was that constant stimulation and I need deadlines. So it's constant deadline and I need constraints to work in. So the constraint of the 500 words. Fantastic job. And I got reactions from people. Listeners who would call in or send letters and so on. So that was kind of a, an, an ideal situation for me. Um, one of the things that I'm going to start with here, and what we've decided to do is we'll read from the mic, but we'll talk here. But if you have trouble hearing us, we'll fix it up. So just raise your hand and, and holler. Um, I published something with the feminist press that was started at the university, at New York University, uh, quite some time ago now. And on its 25th anniversary, the press decided to put out a collection of everybody who published with them of what we thought about feminism today. And so it was wide open, but it was a rather limited, short piece. And so for this little collection called Revision in Feminism Around the World, I wrote a piece that goes as follows. I don't think the New Yorkers were crazy about this piece to tell you the truth. Is this going to work? It's called Rural Women. 
I have long carried a simple mental measuring tool by which I gauge my thoughts on the accuracy, relevance, importance, and inclusivity of any manifesto of feminism. If it does not include the lives of women like my mother, it is not big enough for me. Living from 1900 to 1984, my mother had only six years of schooling in a one-room school in the northwest Wisconsin woods. Same school I went to, of course. But she self-directed her eight decades of education. Learning is not limited to school, she knew, especially when books and pencils and paper and eventually radios and TVs become accessible even in the mo most remote areas. Married and giving birth to her first child at age 16, to be followed by eight others, the youngest, me, born when she was 39, my mother did not recognize maternal and paternal role divisions and limitations. On farms, before electricity, and actually I can remember before electricity, believe it or not, and tractors, there was more than enough for everyone to do, much of it challenging physical labor. When mother and dad sit on adjoining milk stools, son and daughter see little reason why they should divide aid, cultivating, gardening, cooking, carpentering, sewing, or washing clothes along gender lines. My parents lost their hard work, slowly built farm in the Great Depression, and I grew up on a diminished but cozy and secure piece of land and in a four-room house built of scraps. Hardship and dwindling means increased, not decreased, my mother's invention. My life in that small house was rich. When I return to my early home, I see creative reflections of my mother's kaleidoscope, of my mother kaleidoscoped in the lives of my sisters and nieces and childhood friends. When I read and write about U.S. literature, I catch glimpses of her uncomplaining strengths in stories of immigration, of slavery, of both frontier and urban struggle. for me a philosophy and attitude toward learning which is not limited to the opportunities for schooling, a cooperative partnership across gender and generational lines which includes the necessity, the dignity, and the work of physical labor, an assumption of life's challenges and constraints with creative ingenuity. To recognize where these characteristics have been acted out in unheralded lives in our personal and national histories leads organically to a wide-angled view of not just a feminism's future around the world, particularly where the figurative seeds of change have their genesis in the literal seeds of sustenance flowing through women's hands. Nature's abundance, variety, and interconnectedness should be reflected, I believe, in the philosophies by which we human animals live and work in cooperation with nature. We are rooted and we are often transplanted. We make what we can of the soil that shields us. We bloom and we produce. We leave grains for future harvest. Is. And I, I don't know that Carolyn and I have a disagreement. I think 
Maryland's just ahead of her time, see. <laughs> the writing she's been doing has been creative nonfiction in the sense that it's now understood. Um, because I think there has been a shift, and, and we've talked about some of the, the ways that nonfiction is viewed differently. Um, there is a greater emphasis, as Carolyn shows in this essay, on the local, on the small story. Um, there was a time when, when autobiography needed to be written by people of importance, people who were on a national and not international stage, and we've left that. Um, now it is it's a story of the unknown person or the, or the little known fact or story that, that, uh, that comes to your attention. Um, Carolyn, I'm quoting from her in her right about Maya Angelou said that it may be this tendency in Maya Angelou for introspection is somewhat unexpected in autobiography, but she's always been a writer breaking new ground rather than repeatedly planting the same seeds in the same places. <coughs> and uh, I, I would say, say that that tendency towards greater introspection is one of the things that's defining the, the new genre of creative nonfiction. The tendency of uh, I was joking with Carolyn. One of my favorite things to do when I just read a memoir that I love is to go out to Amazon. And I'm sure you've done this, read the reader's comments because they're all categorized by stars. And I love to take a book that I just adored and go to the one star ratings and I click on them to see what people had to say. Because with memoirs, it's always the same. It's, I can't believe how self-absorbed this writer was. All they wrote about was their reaction to this. Don't they know there are people starving in the world? And I was like, why are you reading memoirs? <laughs> it's exactly the same comment. But, you know, in defense of all of these one-star reviewers, I, I think that probably um, a lot of the memoir written today is written with a greater sense of, of, of introspection and self-reflection and how does this, if it's a travel book, how does this place reflect on my beliefs or my experiences or my background as opposed to I am the leading expert in India, or I, I do have you know, the credentials to write on this subject or this piece of history or this, this travel. So if, if there's any uh, tension in our definition, I think it's simply because Carolyn has been doing this kind of writing all her career, writing about the rural stories, writing about um, people whose stories have not been recorded. And I think that that's, that's the exciting place that, that creative nonfiction goes to more often. Um, I don't really know why I'm speaking here because I have far less writing experience than anyone else here. Um, but I guess as a new nonfiction writer, I at least have that in common with a lot of creative nonfiction writers. We tend to come to it late. Um, and I, I started life in theater and from there went on to business. And it wasn't until I was living in Lagos, Nigeria, and quite unexpectedly within the space of two months found myself without home or job or husband, I started to write. And, um, you know, I, I think first it was simply to allay the fears of my friends and family who had every reason to be alarmed that I was living alone in Nigeria with no job. Um, but eventually, and, and not too much later, it became a more or less serious attempt to make meaning of this experience that happened, to, to find out what the heck this was all about and how I did react to this experience, which was utterly life-altering. Um, that Early writing turned into a first train wreck of a memoir, which I then converted into the play, which is which was mentioned in the bio, um, because that was my background and it was a core. I was more familiar with, with writing, and um, and from there I went on to, to write newspaper columns, which was sort of a spin-off of the travel writing. Um, studying with Carolyn has been a great treat, and as, as she mentioned, I've, I've been investigating this thing called creative nonfiction uh, in order to uh, to get an MFA, and we'll be going to Albuquerque to teach composition a class that I've never taken before, <laughs> so that would be interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and get an MFA in, in, uh, in creative writing. I, the, the process of, of, of researching all these universities was fascinating because I figured I should have a better understanding of what creative nonfiction is, right, if I'm going to be getting a master's degree in it, and discovered that there's very little consensus. I mean, uh, there's, there really, it is a moving target. You are not alone in saying, what the heck is this? The easy answer is, it's not fiction. But a lot of it is fiction, you know. Um, Maxine Hong Kingston has ghosts tell the story of her first generation Chinese parents because she needs to bring in the company of ghosts to properly tell the story. And, and this is, uh, this is, 
sort of brings up what Car how Carolyn and I met, working with David Rose to tell the story of Gaylord Nelson. Um, the City Fathers of St. Croix Falls wanted a 40th birthday commemorative piece commission on the life of Gaylord Nelson, uh, the father birthday. And we, I contacted Carolyn, who I never, never met, to serve as the leading humanities expert. Um, she agreed to do that and was working with David Rhodes, who I'm sure a lot of you know from Driftless, um, a one Call it the same name this town. A one 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 Right. <laughs> um, he researched not just the life of Gaylord Nelson, but the geology of the river and the history of the St. Croix Valley and the early trading days and, and the political life of the Democratic Party from its formation and, you know, intensely researched piece that then began by having the St. Croix River talk. And I think the city father would be surprised the first draft. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, in this mind, to my mind, this is what creative nonfiction is. He used all of these, these uh, painstakingly researched, um, took the, pain, the painstaking research he had done and created a very musical and imaginative narrative that allowed the reader to speak and tell the history in a way that wouldn't be possible. And uh, this is River. Oh, yes. In the play, do you remember River? Any of the things you yeah. said? I, I clear out my eyes. But I thought that was a fascinating example sort of where my world's met of theater meeting history, meeting creative <coughs> nonfiction writing, and, and coming up with something that was, that was I think, a remarkable and product by an author who, who writes fiction. So that was our. Um, I was going to read something short. Sure. In applying to the uh, to the MFA programs, I had to do a lot of paperwork. I also had to take the GRE. And for anyone who has a, has a near 50-year-old spent a day in a windowless room with a lot of 25-year-olds taking <laughs> a standardized test on a computer, I recommend it because everything will seem so much easier afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take a GRE and I had to submit my writing sample, which is really all they cared about, but I also had to write my teaching philosophy, and as I mentioned, I've never taught, but I'm not even an English major, so that was, that was an imaginative exercise, so I took that one. And then I had to have my statement of purpose. And for that, I imagined they wanted something scholarly and thoughtful, and I could think of nothing scholarly and thoughtful. This is what I wrote and did not say. Why do I write nonfiction? Why do I write nonfiction? <laughs> First, there is the reason that is leveled at most memoir writers extreme self absorption. This is certainly true of me, although I suspect if I were to change the name of my protagonist from Perry to Sherry and I to she, I might be thought more imaginative and less narcissistic. But I am a bit self-absorbed, and I suspect I do lack imagination. When it comes right down to it, this is not why I write nonfiction, however. Again and again, I am struck by my inability to compete with reality. Since I cannot count the number of times that the men played to me, I will simply tell a true story that I've never told before. I was married for many years to a man who was deeply depressed. He finally left me after a year-long affair with a Brazilian hairdresser in Brazil. I was utterly unaware of the affair, an astonishing feat of willful blindness, but that is not the story. Four years later, he divorced again. This time, from the former wife of an Iranian arms dealer. <laughs> My ex-husband has a child with a woman, and he was arrested on trumped-up charges of domestic violence that she had apparently concocted in order to remain in the U.S. But that's not the story either. The charges were dismissed, but my ex-husband lost everything in the battle to clear his name and fight for his young son, Nate. He lost his retirement savings, custody of his son, and all hope. He burned his possessions, quit his job, and mailed a few mementos to me, including lots of Nate's hair. Then late on New Year's Eve, he sent a farewell message to me and everyone important in his life. And he disappeared. If I were writing fiction, I know how this would end. Instead, I received a photograph a week later. There were several photographs, actually. All the photos were the teddy bear that used to belong to his son. Nate's small bear was posed in a variety of amusing positions, 
and all the photos were taken directly in front of the heads on Easter Island. That's the reason I got nonfiction. <laughs> and has a, impacted so many people, maybe didn't have it right the way it happened in the book. So what do you think about all that? Is it, now you know about three, um, a million pieces, right? Is that the name? A million little pieces. A million little pieces. <coughs> James Spray. And Carrie knows where he actually was for drug rehabilitation. Well, it's a local story, you know, so there are a lot of people around who know, who know um, and I, I, I did have a chance to chat with the publisher who turned the work down because he didn't feel it was accurate and, and you know, what he did, did uh, well, about a number of things. But, um, I, I, would you like a little bit of a discussion? Would you like to tell you? I guess my, my take on, on all of that controversy is that ultimately it didn't change the genre very much. But what it did make clear was that readers do have expectations of authors. And that expectation is a kind of contract that says, tell me a story, but tell me what kind of story this is. <coughs> if this is going to be an imaginative story, then let me know that this part's imagination. If, if you're going to tell me the journalistic research truth, and you're going to swear that these are the facts, don't lie to me about the facts. But I think, you know, I, I mentioned Maxine Wong Kingston bringing in ghosts. And, and David Rhodes having the river speak. I don't think anyone stormed out of the theater saying, I've been living in the same prayer for 40 years and has never talked to me. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't think readers are that naive. I think they become angry when they feel they've been fooled and they've been led astray. And, and, and my conclusion after reading a lot of the, the hullabaloo that followed with that was that it was, it was an unclear contract between author and, uh, and reader. And I, I, I even had the privilege of asking this publisher, well, does this mean the publishers now have a new role? Are they required to be fact checkers in a way they haven't had to be in the past? And there doesn't seem to be any great push towards that. It seems as if publishers have the same kinds of conversations they've always had with authors. And, and, and authors have the same kinds of expectations from readers, but now, as we go into a form of nonfiction that is less literal and does have borrow more of the literary devices from fiction than ever before, the, the obligation of the writer has suddenly changed. And somehow making clear what kind of book you're going to be reading <laughs> becomes an issue in a way it hasn't really before. Um, I, I now get a real kick out of reading the forewords and memoirs because some just say, memory is fallible, so who knows if this is true. And some say, I've done my very best to confirm the facts. It's possible that I missed something, you know? And, uh, and, and everything in between. But it is a, it's a fascinating thing for me to see uh, this line between the very well-researched, journalistic, historically accurate autobiography or biography and the one that just kind of, you know, takes off on an idea or a recollection or a memory. And, and where authors and readers find their comfort level. There's also a movement within academia, apparently, to sort of create genres that will clearly delineate and make it clear that there's this kind of creative nonfiction and then it'll be slightly different, and I think it's going to fail. <laughs> I think as soon as you try to confine writing, you know, shoot fun on the wall, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that will be successful. But it'll be fun to watch because I'm um, um, still isn't offering an MFA of nonfiction, although I would say a majority of, of programs now are. And I, I see them kind of scrambling to say what exactly is included. They know it's not journalism, but it has, it has journalistic elements within it. So it's, it's, a, it's a new field, it's an interesting one, and just from the show of hands, you know, a lot of people are writing about their lives, about their experiences, and borrowing from their background and their strengths as fiction writers and poets to do it. So the, 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 the way it goes will be very fun to watch, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we get a chance to talk about it. I think one of the confusions <clears throat> comes from the fact that we're using all the same tools across what we've made divisions between. Um, so for example, Bruce Dillipson's comments this morning all pretty much apply also to native nonfiction. 
I mean, things like using active verbs, things like, you know, not overdoing alliteration, but being aware of alliteration. Now, all these things that poets will use, prose writers also use. <laughs> um, we, we all have, we share the same tools. The question seems to come, and I, I, I will use a little example here. I have a biography of, of the woman who is the founder of the NAACP, Mary White Ovington. I was working on this when I was in a seminar at NYU in New York City, and I had written a chapter about a day in 1938 when she was at her Berkshire cabin picking up sticks after a storm, and the phone rang, and she gets the news of the death of her very good friend, James Weldon Johnson, in a car accident. And I checked the weather reports, you know, what the weather was in Berkshire. I knew where the, when the storm had been. I knew she was picking up sticks because she wrote that in a letter. I knew basically what the phone call told her. And so I wrote it like one would write a story or a novel, right, with the dialogue, the description, and so on. And these historians in this class went berserk. I mean, this was 1989. Said, Carolyn, you can't do that. That's too much like a novel. And I'd say, well, yes, but I know this, 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 and this, and this. They're all true. Why can't I use the tools of a novel? Now I think historians are not afraid of doing that. I think that's how much it's changed in a very short time. So um, anyway. <laughs> I think that's partly where the confusion comes. And we're actually almost at the point where we are going to be. Yeah. All right. You know, I think I'll just read from here. Um, I uh, was talking about travel writing leading to my colleague. And I did bring um, I did bring a piece of travel writing that's finding its way into a memoir, just to share. I was in the water when I saw a flash of blue on the shore. The blue was my wrap. I recognized the color immediately. A moment earlier, two young boys had been walking down the beach. I saw them just as they grabbed my wrap. The wrap covered my bag, which contained everything I had brought with me to the beach. They saw me in the water, and they ran fast into the jungle with my bag. No! I yelled from the water. No, no, no! But my yelling inspired me to run faster, and they were now totally out of sight. I started to run into the jungle and attracted the attention of several men nearby. A woman in a rainbow striped bikini yelling, no, 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 at the top of her lungs will attract attention. And they came running. A lack of Swahili hampered things for a moment, but in an earlier career in theater, had sharpened my pantomime skills in preparation for just such a moment. And they got the idea quickly enough. We all stormed off together into the jungle, in a furious lie. I remembered later where I had seen those two boys and why I was so certain they were boys, not young men. I had seen them on the beach earlier, playing like puppies, challenging one another and trying to do push-ups with one sitting on the other's back. Even from a distance, I could see they were egging each other on to greater deeds of daring. It was a quiet day at the beach. I was on Pemba Island, the lesser-known island of Zanzibar, off the coast of East Africa, a place that sees perhaps a dozen tourists at a time, and most of those taking organized diving tours. There were no tourists today on this long, lovely stretch of beach. There were no prowling professional vandals because there were no tourists to steal from. There were only a handful of fishermen standing waist-deep in the low tide, with nets stretched between them, slowly working their way down the shoreline, and, because it was a Saturday, there were a couple of families with coal boxes sitting in the shade, drinking beer and eating out of large plastic bowls. Which is why I remember those two boys. I saw the flash of blue and my indispensable day pack disappear with my camera, nearly full journal, sunglasses, sunscreen, telephone with Tanzanian SIM card, earphones and MP3 player, a 17-year-old hat that had traversed the world on my head, and a little notebook with the 
names and addresses of the people I had met along the way, as well as writing ideas, a few phrases in Swahili, and a list of ladies from Lagos who might like to take pole dancing lessons. <laughs> While the last item's importance could be argued, it certainly was not replaceable. The race, the race into the jungle was fruitless, as you might have imagined it would be. It is only in the movies that the perpetrators are caught by the woman in the rainbow striped bikini, leading a small posse of outraged vigilantes. In real life, the men in hot pursuit lose interest almost immediately, and the woman in the striped bikini gets her legs scratched and realizes there are countless little rabbit trails heading off in every direction, and she cannot possibly guess which one the boys took. And she returns every hand. As soon as it was obvious what had happened, the required self-recriminations began, along with an inventory of damages. First and foremost, no money was lost, no passport tickets, credit cards, or other items of great worth. One of the many useful things about traveling in general, and traveling alone in particular, is that it requires the exercise of deciding what I can afford to lose and what I'm willing to carry. This is a valuable exercise, whether one's traveling or not. Before I left Lagos, I had a long and interesting argument with my roommate, Nora, about the ethics of cutting apart a travel book in order to carry only that part of the country I planned to visit. This seemed eminently sensible to me, but on the order of a felony offense to Nora. So I acknowledge there are differing points of view, but however you come down on the subject of book mutilation, extent of travel is an exercise in way, literally way, one's priorities. I followed my father's advice and purchased a camera that, in his words, would not ruin my vacation were it to fall off a mountainside or presumably disappear into a jungle. <coughs> I briefly entertained, I briefly, I briefly chastised myself for taking the camera to a place as risky as a beach, but stopped before getting too deeply into self-flagellation. I wouldn't take any pictures if I didn't bring the camera. If I bring the camera, I risk losing it. These two facts of travel are inextricably linked, hence my father's off the side of the mountain school of camera shopping advice. I was not thinking about the monetary cost. I was thinking of all the pictures I would not be taking. I guess that these two boys were not professional thugs. They were not desperate or hungry. They were not driven to criminal acts out of a sense of outrage or entitlement. These two boys were just boys. And snitching a lady tourist bag was as meaningless to them as petty theft from a corporation. There could be no real re repercussions because there was no real victim. The victim was an abstraction, a comical foreign white lady with a beach bag. Nothing to do with anything really. More than likely, someone knew them, I thought. So I made myself a bit more decent. My beach rag was not taken, another blessing. And accompanied by the would-be vigilante men as interpreters, I approached the nearest picnicking family and inquired if they had seen anyone meeting my rather vague description. I received a few sad head shakes, a bit of sympathetic tutting, but nothing to indicate that these boys had anything to do with the family on the beach. And so I was startled. And the patriarch of this family, a fat older man with no shirt, sitting on a coal box, asked me in English and in a loud voice, Why are you alone? His tone was angry, accusatory. I did this, he seemed to say. I caused this trouble on the beach. I felt my eyes begin to sting as I tried to form an answer in my head, but my answer was no good in English and would be no better in Swahili. Why am I alone? Surely, I'm a fool to be alone. And I realize that I must seem, and probably am, ridiculous. A middle-aged woman who is alone. A white lady in a black country who has lost her back. This is not worth upsetting your picnic, disturbing your peace, and I do, I really do understand that. Why am I alone? I've spent nearly every day for the past two years since my divorce, wondering the same thing myself. I didn't exactly expect to be alone at this point in my life. You really have to know, Mr. Colbox. Given my brothers, I would have had a travel companion and a beach bag guardian. But things didn't turn out quite as I hoped. Still, I don't think that means I deserve to have my bag stolen. I just lost the camera I was going to use to take photos of your country. I lost my journal with thoughts and feelings in it that I didn't want anyone else to read. I lost my notebook with the names and addresses of all the friends I've made since I started traveling. I've 
lost quite a bit in the past couple of years, Mr. Colbox, and I really didn't feel like losing anything else. All this is circling through my head as I feel dangerously close to pride, and he again demands, why are you alone? Because I am. I yelled back. And I stomped off in my rainbow striped bikini. A ridiculous figure. The next morning, I got on the ferry leaving Panama. It was a beautiful day. The water crossing over the mainland was a color I could never have captured on the camera that was no longer mine. It was not the turquoise blue of Zanzibar, nor the slate blue of the open sea. This blue was a sapphire blue. A true, clear blue that seemed too intense for my eyes to take in. The crew of the ferry was playing a live recording of the Egyptian singer Um Patum. I could not remember ever hearing a more haunting voice. I stared out at that blue, blue water and listened to her voice for hours. I got a sunburn, no more sunscreen, and when I landed, I hopped into a bus, which broke down almost immediately as soon as we left town. <laughs> Everyone from the expired bus squandered out to the next bus that came along, which was already full, before it took us aboard. I have no idea how many of us there were all together. As we headed up into the mountains, everyone was fine. We were standing too close together for anyone to fall. The conductor helped me from the new bus onto yet another bus, which took a lot of sharp switchbacks and eventually brought me high into the mountains after dark. I landed in a tiny town called Sony and a little hotel called the Old Sony Hotel, where they were kind enough to make an omelet for me at a very late hour. When I woke in the morning, I was astonished to look out my window and see gorgeous sheer cliffs and a waterfall. Vines loaded with big trumpet-shaped blossoms and pine trees absolutely filled with monkeys. Monkeys staring right back in the window at me. And I knew what they were thinking. Ridiculous.
I don't know, I don't know what exactly he said on Oprah about that. But I think that it's possible, like the Maxine Hong Kingston example, and as Carrie says, have an agreement with the reader that the truth as I see it, the whole truth, is going to come out in all these different kinds of ways with all these devices that may not be actually correct. There are no ghosts, actually. But that there's something called truth. Now, I think we've got a journalist here who wears a journalist. <laughs> um, this must be something you kind of have thought a lot about in relation to your journalism and your other writing, right? Sure, sure. And I used to stick to this great story all the time. I'm Carrie and I are talking about the book that I wrote, Got Me on the Willows, and whether I embellished any of that at all. And I said, well, you know, a lot of people in today's world would embellish. And I said, I didn't do any, and I gave her an example. The couple had their, their wedding, and they were driving toward Portage, and I imagined what they might have talked about. And I explained that I was imagining what they might have talked about. You know, I wasn't saying that they definitely talked about this, but you could assume that they, they talked about the fact that the bride's family wasn't at the wedding and what that meant to them. And that they're maybe happy to get out of town and get away from that clash of religions between the two families. And maybe they started to talk about starting their own family since that parent was what attracted the bride, the only child, to this family of lots of people, the groom's family. But I didn't embellish it to say that's exactly what they talked about because who knows? They're driving to their deaths that time. I think the free problem, I mean, the, the thing about this that has bothered me a lot is that I know of some cases, and Frey is another case, where the, the writer wants to write it as fiction just in order to have the freedom to express whatever. And the publisher or the agent says, you know, I can sell this as a memoir, but I can't sell it as fiction. And so there is a lot of push toward turning something into a memoir. The example I like to use, because this kind of fits with the fact question, is I, I'll try not to say too much about the book. Some of you may know her or know the, the, uh, the book. But I, I know someone who wrote a book about her war experiences and I know the people that she's writing about in there. She doesn't say anything that wasn't factual, but she definitely misleads people by leaving out information as to what the character of her husband was, for example. So in other words, she pushes the reader in a certain direction in evaluating this man just by leaving out important things in a total evaluation, is that, I mean, that is equally dishonest to giving an untruth, I think. Uh, and yet that, that works all right. She was actually pressured, she was writing a novel and pressured to turn it into a memoir. So in some ways, I kind of have to excuse her. But the book I found very upsetting because it just did not match up with the reality that I knew about the people that we both knew. Uh, there's a lot of touchy questions here, yeah. It's yeah, I mean, I, I think that that the spray example and that example are not, I mean, really break that context we're talking about. And I think there's, uh, there's a continuum of examples that are way lesser than that, that I think yeah. are much less muddy and much less um, deceptive and kind of different. I find I write How a lot of I write a lot of things that are they're funny, so there's a, the stakes are lower, yeah. <laughs> and and you know I think, but and, and my standard is simply is do I pr pretty much feel that that's what happened? You know I can't. There's no one I can really ask. It, you know I try to. Sometimes my brother will say I don't really remember it that way, but his memory is not necessarily any more reliable than mine because he doesn't really remember. So. I feel like that's a different kind of compact, do you know what I mean, um, than total deception or just totally taking a husband and mischaracterizing a gamut of things about their personality, you know. Well, it involves other person too. I feel, I feel less obligated to the, the owners of the delivery van than I would to, you know, 
and a cousin, or you know, a brother, right. or so, you know, that where, where I think that, that you owe them the right to a, to a, a dignified, but accurate, you're capable of portrayal. And I think so maybe the more social I had to draw the line, that's, that's where I would try to put it. But, but there's a lot of discussion of this out there. It is, yeah. it's, it's interesting. I actually, um, just this week, was dealing with this very um, situation with my editor. And um, we, we came about where a couple of the facts could be shortened. I, I wrote a very lengthy scene from a really powerful fight that turned into a powerful message on women and education and growing. So it was something within a kind of a lighthearted memoir that had to be acted. And it was dealing with my son and a date of mine, a boyfriend, belittling books. Apparently, the way I had written it, my editor said, well, first of all, wait a minute. We have to cut this out, this out, this out. Her rewrite came back to say, my son and I leaving the library with his stack of books in his arms, da 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 and then we go into this very powerful, irate interaction between me and this man. It's strict, but regardless, the point, I, I read this, and I went, even my son would be furious if I wrote something like that about him because it was very, it was a flat out lie to my reader. We weren't leaving the library. My son wouldn't go to the library. God love him. <laughs> he wouldn't carry around that book in his arms. But what I was able to say, we have actually loved the Harry Potter movie. We got rid of that. She doesn't want to be referencing Harry Potter and things like that. And said, after trying to continue his, you know, grow his love of books, this man put this down. Um, and by removing some of it, it became true in my perspective, whereas before I was misleading the reader. And so I think the idea was that, and I'm using a lot of words to get to this point, but if your perspective feels true and you feel that the main points are there, then you've said the message and it's okay to change up little bits of the reality to make a better, more impactful. And will you say something to that effect in publication of this memoir? I actually am rewording the beginning. I read yesterday um, the opening to the memoir, and we state that all facts true. You know, that's our my interpretation. So we're actually going back into that beginning and making sure that the reader knows because I wrote you know a very open, very telling, painful story about online dating. Well, all of these men who are brutally and fun and being portrayed as toast, that's my reality. That's <laughs> and they have it coming. But they're great men, but you know what, they'll read it and they'll know that's not how it happened. But that's right, happened. that's right. Would you defend that at all? I would defend that. I absolutely would. But you know, it's, it's my truth. It's how I read this wonderful, you know, Carlos, my Portuguese soccer player, you know, he was a poor martyr. No, he wasn't out sleeping with soccer moms. Of course he wasn't. Well, maybe he was. And maybe somebody else would stand up and say, yes, he did. But my reality is, you know, he's just beautiful. And I, you know, he names. And I change names. Yeah, right. But it's, it's perspective, I think. Um, a very interesting conversation. It reminds me of um, in another form of nonfiction, which is the autobiography where you have historically documented facts, but you get the author's version of the truth from that, or else, you know, you would only be one definitive autobiography of, of various historical figures. Uh, I'm a, a Civil War history buff, and, and there, if you just took the amount of books written on Abraham Lincoln, I think you'd have a library, you know, of your own on that. And so, I'm kind of wondering what your thoughts are on as far as, you know, finding, you mentioned the, the fellow who wrote the biography on Gaylord Nelson, who started, took it from the perspective of the St. Croix River. Obviously, you know, as far as fact, the river doesn't actually speak as, you know, the language that, uh, but obviously there's, you know, fact, the facts of Gaylord Nelson's life are, are well documented. Um, <laughs> kind of lost my point there, but, <laughs> um, but what, 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 do you think writing, I mean, the, the facts 
in your own truth. Maybe that's people are having a, a hard time dealing with. You know, I mean, there's obvious things that can be documented, tracked down. Uh, but well, having worked on biography a lot, writing about someone else, mm -hmm. I believe that selection is the the, the big piece. In other words, you can select facts to do anything you want. And so that's where the honesty comes in, is what you leave out, what you put in there, what who the reader is of this particular piece. Like these, I did a lot of entries in, I've got it over there, the uh, auto, uh, Encyclopedia of African American History. Well, you're writing in an encyclopedia, you kind of have a different thing in mind than you would if you were writing a full biography. And then you have the, the word limitations. But you really have to think through what, it, what are the essentials about this person or this event or this organization or whatever. That's where the big questions come in. And so I guess that's, that's kind of carries across the board. The same would be true of our own memories. How we remember an event, well, <coughs> we know that Proust, you know, remembered 10 volumes <laughs> from a bite of a cookie, right? <laughs> so you, you still have the same question, always have that question. And I think that question is very much dealing with the truth, too, the truth as you see it. So I suppose I'm going back to thinking that the, the big problem today is this emphasis on memoir as a sellable product, that the pressures on people at every level for that is what's pushing people to do things that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise do. And I, I slightly <coughs> the truth when you write memoir because you get this frisson from the reader. They get this thrill in beginning a story with, this happened to me, this is true. And, and I think there's something very fundamental in storytelling when you begin a story that way. You do get something from a reader when you say, no, believe what happened to me. Uh, it, it, is, it is a wonderful way to tell a story. And, and true stories do have a universal appeal how we manage them and how we deal with the issues of truth. I mean, that's, that's what we're wrestling with. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've always struggled with shades of gray. Uh, and it's part of life. Uh, you're always struggling with shades of gray. Uh, but you know, I also believe that integrity matters. Uh, and so you have to decide whether Those things really happen to Shakespeare in 
more books, and I'm surprised to see him talking. This so kind of all goes back to this principle. <laughs> uh, and I'm curious about that. If, if people really feel that, that there is something very exciting and, and drawing you as a reader, if you know or if you're told that something is true, that it really happened, is that a real pull? How many say yes? <coughs> I might just go the opposite way. So let's talk about the Celestine prophecy. He said this isn't true, and yet how many people believe that in fact it was true? I mean, he, and he kept coming out saying this isn't true, it's fiction. But people believed every word. So, so we want things to be. I think so. I think we so. That's yeah. part of it. I just go ahead. Um, you know, I mean, I, this is a very interesting conversation, but as someone with background in history and theology, this sort of playing with the word truth and fact, and as though some things are true whether you accept them or not. Right? John F. Kennedy was assassinated. That's a fact. It's true that it happened. There's maybe could, someone that doesn't believe it happened, but... But you could choose a different word than assassinated. You could say killed, shot. For sure. You say assassinated, you have right away done something more with that event than just reported it directly. Well, the well, language it's itself, it's the language that we use something. manipulates people. Okay, who's killed whether you believe it or not? Right, right. I mean... But I, I don't think it's any easier for historians. No, it's, it, it's not. And it, I think historians sometimes don't ever write anything because of fear that you cannot absolutely prove that everything is accurate. I'm thinking of that, that seminar that I had at NYU the prof, Tom Bender, who's written all these books on New York City, described working on his dissertation. And he was down in the bowels of this library reading all these 16th century sermons, you know, week after week, a month, year after year, in preparation for writing about it. And he goes to his advisor and says, you know, I just don't know if I can really say such and such as a generalization about these sermons. And the advisor just says, my gosh, you know, you have read more of these sermons, he probably said damn sermons, <laughs> than anyone in the wide world. If what you say about the sermons can't be trusted, well then, what can we know? You know, in other words, you're always up against that, the, the drawing about. conclusions from the evidence, yeah, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's the probability. What what most probably happened. Right. Um, but you know, we're talking about some people think you can see the early fiscal. See, I just think of something like that as as historical fiction. You know. Creative not I mean, I guess the, if if your intention is to this is historical fiction. It's the suspension of disbelief. You are asking earlier about the, the, if we read in a book, this really happened, does that draw us in? And I was like, wanting to raise my hand, but not, because it, if I'm going to willfully suspend my disbelief, absolutely, yeah, that, 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 it's more the Da Vinci Code. It's a perfect example. People think that has accurate history in it, because in the first page of the book, says this is all actually literally true. This is what happened. This is how you know, religion, Christianity began. And I love the book, but it's not history. And I mean, you can't sell, sell the mark at the book, and I understand in the way how it's said, yeah, it's fiction. But if your intention is to deceive people, I think there's a problem. I, you know, there's that's an ethical problem. I mean, Boyd was talking about the, the what is your intention? Is it to deceive people or to entertain people? And I think that's 
you know, if, I, if I'm writing, not writing a memoir, but if I'm writing a memoir and I said, all of this really happened in my life, and then I go on to explain about how I, you know, met the Queen of England and, and, and on and on and on, and I never did any of that. Well, if it's being marketed as this is my life as best I remember it, that's kind of like, no, you're kind of lying. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. deliberate deception. Deliberate deception. Yeah. yeah. Rather, that's a lot different than a little boy trying to remember signs on. Yeah, signs on a bus. I mean, because. Yeah. Um, but the point that the woman was making is that it's 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 a continuum. It, it is very difficult to say exactly where that line in the sand is, and I think that's what's being wrestled with right now, and that's why it's an interesting question we're talking about. You know, with the group of writers. I mean, <laughs> the sign on the bus is, you know, our mind, our brain going to fill that in. Yeah. about how I can remember things better. I, I've heard some people say, go by your hairstyle. Like, what was your hairstyle during that moment in time? Try to, to place it, look it up online, and find out what was playing on radio or what was a hit on TV, that kind of thing. But it's a good, uh, it's a good question. I mean, there are a lot of people who, especially when they get to be my age, are saying, oh, you know, I want to get my memories down what things were for my grandchildren, my children, and so on, and it's important to do. I think all those ideas are, are good. Now, I teach uh, writing classes, community ed writing classes, and I think, and some people are here from those classes, the things that one person writes will kind of get someone else started. And so if you're in some kind of a writing group, if you divide it up, if you have, you know, like one week it's a job I've had, and one week it's a school I went to, and one week it's one of my relatives, and one week it's, you know, so that you, you're not thinking of having to do everything all at once. But if music can set it off, or a taste of something can set it off, get it down there right away, and don't worry about how it comes together eventually. I think that's where people, kind of fail is they think they've got to start at the beginning and write it chronologically. No. Some people in my writing class who've been in there for a few years now are amazed to find they have a whole book because they've written bits and pieces of different memories. Now the question becomes one of arranging, organizing, you know, giving transitions and so on. But uh, just get the stuff out there. And don't worry, if you have a group of writers to support you, I think that's very helpful. I would say it's not very helpful to show your writing to someone who doesn't write, for the most part. Even if it's someone very close to you. I think you need other people who are trying to do the same thing in order to get that support group. I would just add, don't assume your life is over. Start journaling if you're not journaling right. now. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's been waiting for a while. Right. Um, Jerry, have you read Travel Writing? Is that what that was? Well, it, it's, it started as Travel Writing, and I'm incorporating it into it. And, and when you submitted it, was it to a travel book? No. Not, and, this, and this is where the definition gets interesting, too, because you know, you have books like Lonely Planet and, and you know, that are, that are very that are long, hundreds of years of people visiting countries and writing about their experiences, but writing very little about themselves in that experience. And then you have people like Bill Bryson, you know, I don't know anything about Australia until I land. And then, you know, this happened to me, and who knew that he was a president, you know, I mean, just that, that wonderful sort of, you know, stranger in a strange land voice. And so travel writing, I think, is one of the easiest examples to look at and say, this is a genre that's really changed and has a lot of diversity within it. Um, I am not an expert traveler. There's no country that I would write definitively about. But I do enjoy the experience of writing uh, as my experiences as a, as a novice traveler. And I, and I find that to be a, a rich source of, of inspiration. That one was actually was a piece that was submitted for, for my MFA. It's also in the, the newest draft of the memoir. It wasn't part of the play. So 
Thank you so much. I just want to add one, one little thing. I started out saying, I represent the past, here in the future. I think if you look at the book, Eat, Love, Pray, and Eat, Pray, Love, and two people's reactions to it, you would characterize our differences, <laughs> maybe mostly our differences. Uh, because I read that book and ended up jealous that anybody would send somebody for three months expenses paid to write about eating and praying and loving. And Carrie, I'm going to do that. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.